Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland Friday Forum. Today is Friday, April 6th, and I welcome all of you here to the state's premier civic affairs event. I'm Melody Rose, I'm the president of City Club, and I'm delighted to welcome members and guests alike. Those of you who are joining us here physically in the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, and of course, those of you watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today we will hear about what federal and state health care reform mean to all of us. No small topic. City Club's corporate and media partners are essential to the vitality and sustainability of all of the club's activities, including this one. I want to thank our generous media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, for supporting this work. I'd also like to extend our deepest appreciation to the new spring season Friday Forum corporate sponsors, who include ESCO Corporation, Morel Inc., Northwest National, Natural, and Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt. We are very grateful for your support. And if any of you would like to explore corporate membership, please do see our friendly staff at the back of the room or come to City Club offices where we can talk about this partnership. For nearly 100 years, City Club has provided nonpartisan civic leadership in our region and strengthened our whole community. With member support and wide participation, City Club produces over 100 civic events every single year, including this one. Along with multiple research reports, time-honored ballot measure studies, and other wonderful events. This week, City Club launched our spring membership drive with the ambitious goal of finding and joining 250 new members to the club. I hope you will all support City Club in this endeavor. And to give you a primer, there are three things I would ask that you do to help us bring new club, club members to us. One, you can invite someone to City Club's many April events and see our website for a full listing. Two, feel free to tweet during this Friday forum as it's happening. And three, before you go, please be sure to grab a membership brochure and give it to your colleague when you get back to the office. There are incentives for those of you in the room who participate in this month's membership drive. All new members will save $25 if they join City Club in the month of April. Even better, the person who recruits the most members this month will receive a night out on the town in our fair city. The winner will get a dinner for two at Higgins Restaurant and two tickets to a Portland Symphony production in May. So please help us build our club. And remember, membership really matters. Help us spread the word and help us be just as strong in our next 100 years. Following today's talk, we will be welcoming City Club members to the microphone for our traditional question and answer period. In addition, I invite all audience members to locate the index cards on your tables and fill out questions there. When I ask, please hold them high and the City Club staff will come and retrieve them from you and bring them to me so I can be sure to ask at least one of these questions as I'm sure you'll have great ones today. And now for our program and our speakers. With massive changes occurring in healthcare on both national and state levels, many Americans are wondering rightly, how will healthcare reform impact me and those I care about? Today, Bruce Goldberg and Mike Bonetto will begin to answer this very complex question. Our first speaker today will be Mike Bonetto. Mike has a unique portfolio of healthcare policy and planning expertise. He is currently the health policy advisor to Governor Kitzhopper and has been the vice president of business and community development for St. Charles Health System, as well as the senior vice president of planning and development for Clear Choice Health Plan. Mike received his PhD in health policy and his master of public health from Oregon State University. His current activities include serving as president and co-founder of Health Matters of Central Oregon and sitting on the Deschutes County Public Health Advisory Board and the Oregon Health Policy Board. 
Our second speaker, Dr. Bruce Goldberg, is a family medicine physician who has devoted his professional career to improving the organization, delivery, and finance of public health services. He served as the director of the Oregon Department of Human Services from November 2005 through February 2011, a position he says he was drawn to because of the opportunity it provided for making such a positive difference in the lives of so many people. He led the formation of the Oregon Health Authority as the director designee and was permanently appointed director by Governor Kitzhopper in February a year ago. And with that, please help me in welcoming our first speaker, Mike Bonetto. Thank you, Mike. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for having us here today. I know you've asked us here to talk about the very pressing topic of health care reform in our state and all the exciting things that are happening. And we will. We'll share with you the bold and innovative solutions that have been put forward by our governor and our bipartisan legislature with the help of thousands of Oregonians. When you leave here today, you'll have the ability to impress your friends, family, and neighbors with your firm grasp on health care policy in Oregon and your ability to articulate our solutions clearly and succinctly like never before. And I promise I'm going to get to all that. But first, first I want to spend a minute talking with you about baseball. There's a movie that came out last year that you may have heard of. It was nominated for an Oscar. It starred some guy who's married to Angelina Jolie. It's called Moneyball. If you've seen it, you'll understand what we're doing with our health care system in Oregon. Now I know just looking at us, you can see this, that the similarities between Brad Pitt and Bruce and me are pretty obvious. <laughs> More important, though, are the other similarities. Just like Brad Pitt's character, Oakland A's general manager Billy Bean, we're in a situation where we want to win. In baseball, winning means taking the World Series. For us, winning means a healthy community at a cost we can afford. Until Billy Bean came along, everyone knew the winning formula in baseball. Pay big bucks for star players and put together a winning team. That's the way it had been done for decades. But Bean was working with a team that didn't have much money. He couldn't use the traditional formula. So, also like Billy Bean, we don't have a lot of money. In fact, we entered the legislative session with nearly a $1 billion shortfall in health care. So, how do you win? Billy Bean changed his strategy and built a better team for less money. In Oregon, we changed our strategy to bring better health at lower costs. But to make it work, we also had to change the rules of the game. Our healthcare system in Oregon is changing in two fundamental ways. First, we're creating a better mechanism for individuals and small businesses to purchase health insurance through a state insurance exchange. The plan for the exchange was approved with strong bipartisan support by the legislature last month. We all know that families and businesses need relief from the high cost of health insurance premiums. Come January 2014, they'll be able to shop for high quality, affordable plans through one central marketplace. More immediately, and what Bruce and I will be talking about today, is the change centered on the Oregon Health Plan, Oregon's Medicaid program. The Oregon Health Plan is a state and federal partnership that provides health care for low-income Oregonians. The federal government pays for most of it, but a big portion comes from the state general fund, our state taxes. And each state is responsible for overseeing and administering its Medicaid program. For many people here and listening around the state, the Oregon Health Plan is simply part of our safety net. And it's one of the three core services that our state, our state's responsibility, health care, education, and public safety. But to more than 600,000 Oregonians and their families, and the tens of thousands of local health care providers across the state, it's so much more. The Oregon Health Plan, in fact, covers some 16% of Oregonians and 39% of children. And more than 50% of the babies born in our state are born to mothers covered by the Oregon Health Plan. This program is incredibly important to hundreds of thousands of people in our state. But... Like all healthcare, it's also incredibly expensive. 
The state, just like businesses and families, is faced with the reality that health care costs are squeezing out other priorities in the budget. And costs just keep rising. If food prices had risen at the same rates as medical inflation since the late 1930s, a dozen eggs would now cost about $80. A dozen oranges would cost more than $100. And yet, we keep paying those rising health care costs year after year. That doesn't make any sense. Picture this. If the costs of fleece increase by double digits every year, can you imagine Ma Boyle quietly writing bigger and bigger checks year after year? Of course not. Columbia Sportswear and any other good business would look at any and all ways to lower the costs while keeping their standards high. In healthcare, our options have been limited. When there isn't enough money, which is a chronic situation, we have traditionally done three things. One, we can cut payments to providers. The Oregon legislature had to do that last year to balance the state budget. But everyone knows that cutting payments doesn't help anyone, and the costs are ultimately shifted to all of us in the form of higher insurance premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. The second traditional option is that we can cut the number of people we cover, but we have done that before, and we know that people without coverage drive costs up even further, and those costs are again shifted to all of us. And finally, the third traditional option is that we can cut services to the people we cover, but we know we can only cut services back so far before we see people delaying treatment or not getting the early treatment they need, resulting in people in emergency rooms or with long-standing untreated chronic illnesses, and of course, you guessed it, yet again, those costs are passed on to the rest of us. The state has tried each of these options at one time or another. The results are always the same, because as it turns out, the game is rigged against us. Our system is set up to pay for illness and hospitalizations. Right now, some 80% of health care costs are driven by about 20% of patients many of whom live with poorly managed chronic illnesses, many of whom live with untreated mental illness and addiction issues, many of whom get most or all of their medical care from the emergency room instead of a primary care provider. But giving up is not an option. And to paraphrase a famous line from another baseball movie, there's no crying in health policy. So what if there was a fourth way? What if we really looked at why health care costs as much as it does and found a way to change the game. Let me tell you a story about some lessons learned in Central Oregon, where I'm from. Here's the thing about healthcare. One of the most convenient places to receive care is the emergency room. It's always open. There's always someone there. If you show up, you'll get care. The problem is, of course, that not only is emergency room treatment the most expensive form of care, it's designed for, well, emergencies not for primary care. People who make frequent visits to the emergency room are caught up in a cycle of treat and release, treat and release, over and over, with no improvement in their health, and the bills add up. In Central Oregon, we decided to look at the people who made the most frequent visits to the emergency room to see if we could provide better care and lower our costs. We found that among the Oregon Health Plan members with the biggest medical bills were people who visited the emergency room more than 20 times each year, some as many as 50 times each year. What we learned validated long-held assumptions that inefficient care was right under our nose. And it shows very clearly the immense opportunities to improve care and lower costs. In reviewing these cases, we learned that many of the people making frequent emergency room visits had unaddressed mental health issues that were being treated in the emergency room as physical ailments. One woman, for example, made regular visits complaining of stomach pain, but what she really needed was help managing a mental illness. The emergency room had neither the resources nor the expertise to give her the help she needed to be healthier. A good primary care provider could have looked at all of her health needs and coordinated them together. Get the necessary treatment for physical complaints, but also make sure she is getting support for her mental health challenges. And make sure she has access to a community health worker to help her navigate the health system and understand what her options are. This is a great example of how the old healthcare system is broken. It's certainly broken at the level of care. This person was cycling through the emergency room repeatedly 
without ever getting any closer to resolving the issues that were compromising our health and well-being. But the old system is also broken at the level of budgeting and accountability. When healthcare providers don't stay in touch with each other, including hospitals, they may not have any idea how often their clients are visiting the emergency room. Even if hospitals and healthcare providers had a mechanism for communicating, the system doesn't provide any incentives to share information, let alone to collaborate on a project like this. And when people visit the hospital less frequently, you don't have to be an accountant to understand that that's less revenue to a hospital's bottom line. So the game is actually rigged against collaborating to improve care and lower costs. Now, I'm not saying that our healthcare providers aren't trying to do right by their patients. Not in the least. What I am saying is that the system actually works against them to do it. Let's look at another example. Let's go from Central Oregon to Central City Concern here in Portland. They recently shared a story with us about a 30-year-old man with schizophrenia. But that's not what was sending him to the ER some 40 times a year. It was asthma. Treat and release, treat and release. He didn't want to be there, but when he couldn't breathe, he panicked. He would call 911 and go to the hospital where the cost would rack up, but he never got the help he needed. There are more examples of this everywhere you look everywhere because that's the way the system is set up we pay for treatment we don't pay for health we pay for tests we don't pay for someone to call you on the phone we pay for hospitalizations we don't pay for or provide incentives for providers to talk to each other about your care because that's how the game is rigged this is waste this is measurable waste and inefficiency that is every day putting upward pressure on health care costs in fact, research shows that some 30% of health care dollars are spent on this kind of waste. For the Oregon Health Plan, this amounts to a lot of taxpayer money. In fact, a recent third-party analysis showed significant savings if we could reduce that waste by setting up our system in a different way, one that would pay for health, not just medicine, one that would invest in prevention and chronic disease management, one that would be coordinated and innovative. By doing this, we could save Oregon more than $1 billion over the next three years and more than $3 billion over the next five years. Let me repeat that. $1 billion in three years, $3 billion in five years. All while providing better health to the communities we serve because the lower costs come from improving health instead of withholding treatment. We know the savings are there if we make some fundamental changes. The pilot project in Central Oregon taught us that Band-Aids weren't going to be enough to patch up a broken system. Think of it this way. In any given local healthcare system, the money that pays for the system comes from a single common pool made up of the wages and taxes of the people who live there. In the old way of doing business, the goal of each organization of the system is to extract as many resources as possible from the pool. But that means that new money always has to be found somewhere, by raising insurance premiums, for instance, putting more pressure on individuals, families, and businesses. To build something sustainable that would, be, that would guarantee that people got right care, we would need to bring everyone together and agree upon a common approach that makes the quality and sustainability of the whole system our common goal. We would have to rein in the cost curve we are going to have to take on the challenge of real systemic change. In a nutshell, that's the conversation we had, and it worked. One of our first real wins was in that emergency room pilot project. By stepping in to stop the revolving emergency room door and providing better primary care for the 144 patients who use the ER most frequently, we reduced the net cost of their care by over $600,000 just in the first six months alone. For the Portland man who called 911 when he had an asthma attack, better coordinated care that has kept him out of the hospital for more than a year, the cost of his care has dropped by some 90%. Better coordinated care brings lower costs and better health. That is true for all chronic conditions. Among the most common health issues for Oregon Health Plan members are asthma, drug and alcohol addiction, diabetes, and complex mental health issues. These are all conditions that can be helped by better management of care to lower costs. 
A year and a half ago, our boss, Governor Kitzhopper, a nationally renowned expert on health care and the father of the Oregon Health Plan, was elected to an unprecedented third term. He took office facing a nearly $1 billion budget hole in health care. He knew from experience that balancing budgets by cutting provider rates, cutting services, or cutting people from the Oregon Health Plan wouldn't work. Those are the types of plays you make to deal with a rigged game, but they don't do anything to change it. Coming into office, he said it's time to once and for all change the rules. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Brad Pitt. I mean, <laughs> Dr. Bruce Goldberg, who will tell you how the rules have now changed. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> I, I only wish. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here today to continue talking with you about both baseball and health care. But as a New York Yankees fan, I have to tell you that I do have a little problem with this money ball analogy. Some people say that the Yankees are proof you can build a winning team year after year. It just takes having money. Others, Yankee fans like myself, counter that maybe a comment like that sounds a little bit like sour grapes. It's about the money. And of course, when it comes to health care, we Americans are spending more than just about anyone in the world. But we don't have the best system that money can buy. Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone in this room knows we have tremendous doctors. We have some of the world's best hospitals. We've made tremendous advances in life-saving treatments over the years. But even with all that, we're not as healthy as we should be. We're spending more and more money for an uneven system of care. And the rapidly rising costs of care are making it harder and harder for all of us to be able to benefit from those advances. So what I'd like to do today is paint a picture of what it will really look like for our communities to have high quality, affordable health care. As head of the Oregon Health Authority, a family doctor, the son of elderly parents, when someone tells me they want to change the rules of the health care game, I say, put me in, coach. Like everyone, I face the same frustrations trying to negotiate a very complex health care system. I recently spent time with my parents helping them navigate their medical care. Even as a physician, it was difficult for me to work through the maze of doctors, tests, medicines, more paperwork than you can shake a stick at. We spent a lot of time in waiting rooms, on hold on the telephone. We got a lot of instructions that were difficult to follow. Just changing a single appointment was complicated. It involved multiple phone calls. It's been really, really frustrating. Imagine now, for a moment, someone who counts on the Oregon Health Plan for their care. Trying to navigate the same system herself while holding down a job, taking care of kids, maybe not having transportation options, and almost certainly not having the medical background that I have. Under the Oregon Health Plan today, we've got a fragmented system of 16 physical health care organizations, 10 mental health care organizations, and 8 dental care organizations. It's really a no-win situation for both those who get their care on the Oregon Health Plan and those who provide it. It's a maze for plan members to navigate. Their benefits are divided in three different plans, physical health, mental health, and dental health. I have a hard time navigating one. And because everything is so siloed in our health care system, individual health care providers don't have a way to share information with each other. So a specialist on one side of town has no way of knowing that the test she ordered is the same one that someone on the other side of town ordered the week before. A primary care doc who prescribed a mental health drug to a patient doesn't know that a mental health provider is providing the same medicine. It's bad for the state. It means multiple layers of contracting and paperwork. And it's bad for you and me as taxpayers because we're paying to oversee multiple entities. And most importantly, we're paying, as you just heard, for the waste and the missed opportunities to prevent illness before it snowballs into a crisis. Finally, while the Oregon Health Plan has done a really good job of holding down costs, our current revenue trends, even in the best of years, will not support health care costs that are growing faster than state revenue, than personal income, family wages, or corporate income. 
As Mike mentioned in January 2011, as one of his first actions, Governor Kitzhaber convened a group of healthcare stakeholders, some of which are here in the room, and, and consumers, to change the rules of the game and develop a new model of care. The concepts they developed became the legislation that created coordinated care organizations. Put simply, coordinated care organizations give us the means to have patient-centered care that's focused on improving health and lowering costs at every point in the healthcare system. From the point where you see your health care provider to the way the bills are paid, from the personal level to the population level. A coordinated care organization is a network of all types of health care providers who have agreed to work together in their local communities to serve people who receive health care coverage under the Oregon Health Plan. Together, they're accountable for two important things. One, the health of the people that they're entrusted to care for, and two, for the budget to deliver that care. Let's look at that a little bit more closely. A coordinated care organization is a network of all the parts of our local health care delivery system. What we're doing is laying the foundation for long-term change by bringing everyone to the table, the insurers, the individual recipient of care, community advocates, local community health centers, local government, nurses, doctors, dentists, hospitals, healthcare professionals, mental health care providers. Everybody has to be there in order to create that single point of accountability and to ensure that the incentives are shared. For example, we've got to engage the hospital to say, look, we know you're going to lose money if there are fewer visits to your emergency room or fewer admissions to your hospital. But what if we're able to mitigate that by sharing the savings that are incurred to all of us throughout the entire system? Coordinated, cares are going, co coordinated care organizations are going to do that. They're going to be local organizations. They'll be governed locally. They're going to be led by a partnership between local providers of care and community members. This is because, as everybody knows, all health care is in its essence local. Health priorities differ from community to community. What a community needs to stay healthy is different in Roseburg than it is here in Portland. And we all have a stake in ensuring that our local health system is responsive, accountable, healthy, and viable. Coordinated care organizations will be held accountable for the outcomes of the care they deliver, and they will, be, they will need to do so within a finite amount of dollars. This is important because this is something that really distinguishes coordinated care organizations from the old model of managed care. The old HMOs were really about managing dollars, not about managing care or improving health. They weren't responsible for keeping their members healthy. They weren't accountable for health outcomes. And there were no incentives built in to make prevention and early intervention and community-based care a priority. And they weren't locally governed. Decisions were made hundreds and often thousands of miles away. So back to coordinated care organizations. It sounds simple, right? But in order to do that, we had to actually change state law to allow us, one, to form these organizations, to pay them differently, and to hold them accountable for measurable health outcomes. You may have heard the governor say that there's more than 9,000 different billing codes for various medical procedures and services but there's not a single code for prevention. We had to change that too. We had to change the law to give these new organizations the flexibility they need to provide services outside the traditional model. And finally, we had to set up a system where the rewards for better care are shared across the local healthcare system. Last summer, lawmakers passed House Bill 3650, which created these coordinated care organizations. This past February, they passed Senate Bill 1580, which has launched them. It was a tremendous bipartisan effort. In a year when the Oregon House was split 30-30 between Democrats and Republicans, we came together to pass this bill 53-7. to There were strong leaders from both sides of the aisle and all walks of life. And the legislation itself was created after nearly a year of public input that included public meetings across the state and numerous technical work groups. Last year, there were about 75 public meetings and tribal consultations, getting us to the point where we are in this change here in the state today. 
This past week, the Oregon Health Authority received dozens of letters of intent from organizations interested in applying to become coordinated care organizations. Based on the letters, there is support for forming CCOs in every county in the state. Applications are due this spring, and we plan to have the first CCOs up and running in August. You know, the healthcare system in Oregon is coming together in ways that I would have never thought possible. Former competitors are now at the table forming partnerships focused on improving the health of the communities that they're entrusted to take care of. And I'm excited to see this happening because traditionally, due to the fact that, let's face it, we have never paid well in Medicaid and because of the complicated health issues that Oregon health plan members often face, there really hasn't been a great demand to treat Oregon health plan patients. But that's going to be changing. Truly, we're learning that if we build it, they will come. We know what we want. From our, we all want the same thing. We want better health. We don't want more medical care, more medicine, or more hospitalizations. None of us want to go to the doctor more. None of us want to be admitted to the hospital more. And none of us want to take more medicine. We want to be healthy. We want to take less medicine. But our system pays for more care, as Mike said, more visits, and that doesn't necessarily mean better health. Don Berwick, the recent head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, once commented that the best cardiac care bed is an empty bed. Think about that for a minute. But our hospitals and our doctors are paid for filling them up. Our incentives are wrong. We really would like to have more and more empty coronary care unit beds. That would be the mark of a really functioning healthcare system. Under coordinated care organizations and with support from the federal government, our partner in Medicaid, we'll be able to support activities and interventions that we, knew, that we know improve health. Here's how it'll look at the patient level. Let me tell you a story. It's a story of uh, Mr. Ted Hanberg. Ted is 83 years old. He's a retired radio engineer. He lives in Happy Valley. Starting in December 2010, Ted was hospitalized four times in four months with complications from his congestive heart failure, diabetes, and kidney failure. But Ted was lucky. He was able to participate in a pilot project with his health care provider. He joined a coordinated care team where a range of health care professionals, specialists, primary care, nurses, a pharmacist, shared information about his case and other complex cases. The team helped Ted get his congestive heart failure under control and keep his other chronic illnesses in check. He and his family were active participants in managing his care. Today, it's been just over a year. He just celebrated an anniversary. Ted hasn't been in the hospital. He's been able to live independently with his wife and daughter. But it took a special project to provide this care because under our current system, there's no mechanism for providers to work together in that way. They don't get paid to work as a team. And Mike told you about the Portland man who avoided emergency room care for his asthma and cut costs by 90%. A lot of that cost reduction came from Central City Concern making a smart investment in home visits. And that's what it takes. We've got to step outside of our current way of thinking about health care. Look again at the Central Oregon example that Mike told you about. It did so in part by investing in community health workers, like a woman who's the subject of a story in the Oregonian earlier this year, Becky Wilkinson. Becky parked herself in the emergency room with a list of frequent visitors. She built relationships with dozens of people and over time helped them navigate the healthcare system. Her work resulted in decreasing costs and improved quality of life for all of those people. Again, it seems like such an obvious thing, but it's so unusual that it made the front page story in the Oregonian a couple of weeks ago. I recently heard our situation described this way. If people were constantly falling off a cliff, we could place ambulances under the cliff, or we could build a fence on top of the cliff. Under our old healthcare system, we pay for the ambulances. We don't pay for the fences, and it's true. There's no code on the insurance form to pay for these, community <clears throat> for these community health workers we just spoke about. There's no incentives for providers to work together 
or to reoriented their practices around the needs of their patients, whether that means having things like evening hours or electronic health records, the game has been rigged for more medicine and more health care, not for better health. Under coordinated care organizations, there are going to be incentives to create more jobs for people like Becky Wilkerson across Oregon. They'll provide the kind of community-based support that keeps people healthier and helps them manage their chronic illness. Coordinated care organizations are going to have the flexibility to invest in things that keep people healthy. They can build the fence in a way that works, but they've got to build a fence that works. The key to success will be measuring how we're doing. If we hold down costs but people aren't healthier, we will have failed. In changing the game, we have to change the scoring as well. Coordinated care organizations will be accountable for the health of the population they serve based on some commonly accepted metrics. Things we can measure, such as the differences in health outcomes among racial groups. There shouldn't be any. But, you know, tragically, there are. African-American Oregonians are three times more likely to die from complications from diabetes than white Oregonians. Native Americans here in our state face, de face death rates from lower respiratory diseases at nearly twice the rate of the rest of us. That stains us and should challenge us. CCOs will be expected to implement strategies to reduce that gap over time. Other measurements will include things like being certain all our kids are immunized and reducing the hospital readmission rates. We shouldn't be readmitted for the same thing a week after we were just in the hospital. That just makes sense. When the stakes are as high as they are in healthcare, we've got to have equally high standards for quality. We can't afford a state and a society to pay for care that just simply doesn't deliver. Every measurement will point back to what's called the triple aim. Those are the three goals of our healthcare system. Better health, better care, and lower costs. You've got to have all three legs of that tripod in order to have a healthy system to stand on. Today, we're in the first days of building that new way of delivering care for the Oregon Health Plan. While the budget shortfall that Mike spoke about provided the motivation for that transformation, it's a thoughtful approach that builds on the best practices and innovations that are already happening in our state. It's a shared solution based on a shared understanding of the problem. It's going to take us a few years to get there. But if we're successful, this could help form the basis for improvements for everyone in the state, for all of us. After all, we go to the same doctors, we use the same hospitals, we are all part of the same healthcare system, and we all want the same thing. We all want better health. We all want a better, easier health care system to get care in. And we all want it at a price that we can afford. At the beginning of our remarks today, we promised to help everyone listening impress your friends, family, with your ability to explain health reform in Oregon. So here's what you say. It's about three things, and it's very simple. One, health care costs too much and doesn't give us the outcomes we need because we often pay for the wrong things at the wrong time, like unnecessary emergency room visits that could have been prevented, or asthma attacks that shouldn't happen, or heart attacks that we can prevent. Two, the reason we pay for the wrong things at the wrong time is because the system is rigged that way. Three, in Oregon, we've come together and changed the rules of the game, so we pay for the right care at the right time in the right way. That will bring us better care, better health, and lower costs. That's it. It's simple. Three things. The right care at the right time in the right place will bring better health, better care, and lower costs. A healthy community at a cost we can afford. That's a win for all of us. It's a great vision. It's one that I believe we can get to in this state. Thank you for having us today to talk about it. Thank you very much for the informative talk. If you have written a question on an index card, now is the time to raise it high, hold your arm up so that the staff can see it and come around and collect it from you. The first question for our speaker, as always, comes from our Friday Forum host. Today, that is Promise King. 
Promised is the executive director of Oregon League of Minority Voters and was also a writer on race and politics issues as a columnist for the Portland Tribune. He has been a City Club member since 2008 and is sitting on the Board of Governors. Promise. If we could not fix, if we can not, if we hold down the cost, I will fix the cost, hold down the cost, and we could not fix the problem, we have failed. That's one of the things that I, I got from your speech. My question is, we've heard about all the legalese and happening in Supreme Court and all of the argument for and against what will happen in Oregon if Obamacare or Affordable Care, I want to be nonpartisan here, is struck down? What is the plan? What is the House solution? I promise this is um, a, a fair question. It's certainly been coming up um, a lot in our discussions. And I think it's important to understand kind of really what the Supreme Court is, is uh, reviewing right now. And much of this is based on the individual mandate. And if you think about what Bruce and I just talked about, we really talked about two things. And I, I mentioned briefly the health insurance exchange and then the second piece, really this transformation effort on the Medicaid side. I think could the Supreme Court, um, if its decision struck down the Affordable Care Act, what impact would it have here in Oregon? I think, you know, we have been quite clear that it could have an impact on our health insurance exchange. Much of the business model that has been um, drafted for the exchange is based on that individual mandate, meaning more people coming in to this exchange. If that is struck down, I think that business plan would have to be remodeled uh, to, to, to figure out a sustainability plan without that. What Bruce and I have been talking about on this health transformation, we have been very clear, we are moving forward regardless. I mean, this is delivery system form. When you think about literally the discussion at the federal level, it's been much more of a, a finance issue and an insurance issue. Um, we would be foolish to stop what we're doing because this is the, the one chance we have at sustainability um, that really no other state has been able to, to move forward. So again, I would just articulate, you know, it could potentially impact our insurance exchange, but our reform efforts here from the delivery system side would have no impact. Okay, we'll now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone with their questions. Asking questions at a Friday forum is a privilege of membership. Before asking your question, please state your name and remind us that you're a member, and be sure to ask your question in under 30 seconds, or you'll get the famous or infamous City Club question mark. Also, I'll be sure to read at least one of the index card questions. Uh, Fred Mathis, proud City Club member. And my question is to Mr. Bonetto. Uh, I would like to know the governor's office stand on the proposed independent payment advisory commission. Can you clarify that? The um, Obama plan calls for a change in the way doctors' reimbursements are decided by what is now called MedPAC. And it has on it no members of the community. It's all doctors, 20 of them are specialists, six are generalists. The proposal is to have a new advisory commission from the communities with other than physicians on the commission. Got it, thank you. No, that, that helped clarify that. I, I think if you heard kind of Bruce talking about our payment reform efforts just within um, the CCO framework, we're absolutely in favor of that. Um, I think that's really kind of a discussion that's happening within the Supreme Court of just this issue around severability. Are they going to look at just one issue around the individual mandate, or would the whole um, piece be thrown out? But certainly, um, something that was just mentioned on this, the, the Independent Payment Commission, we're in support. But I think what's also important to understand is we're almost setting those up individually within the CCO structure. So you're really going to have almost a community-by-community community basis to really look at how they want to be able to pay 
um, their individual providers and their communities in order to achieve that element of health. Chris Andre, City Club member. Thanks very much uh, for everything you've said. It's fascinating to me. I um, tend to collect information of this sort. My question is no one yet has been able to convince me that single payer is not, in the end, where we're going to have to wind up. Everything entails uh, expenses on one end or another. I like what you said about the coordinated uh, plan, yet that either you're going to have to rip out everything, the, the existing structures that this is going to replace, or it's just another layer, and I don't mean to belittle it, of bureaucracy. So how a transition would be managed, unless it were a, a very radical transition that and very inclusive, as in single payer, I don't see how that is going to work. There are so many entrenched interests, in other words. It's a, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I'm, the, um, I'm the policy guy, not the political guy. And the, the issue of single payer health plans certainly been a hot political issue in our nation for a, a lot of time. And my guess is that's where it's going to get settled at the political issue. I think in, in its, at its base, what we're talking about in terms of changing how care is delivered so we get better health and better value is something that can be part of any kind of a system, whether it's a single payer or a multiple payer system. This can work in Medicare, which after all is right now a single payer system for all of our uh, citizens over 65. Uh, this is something that is really about how to make care work and can work in whatever system we, we have that in. And I think our goal is right now to start getting the system to work and letting everybody else start to figure out whether or not we're going to have single, double, triple, or uh, quadruple payer system. One question from the tables. How is care for people with employment-based health insurance likely to change in response to the presence of CCOs? No. Well, for, for the employer-based um, community, I think we really have tried to work in concert with the insurance exchange and our CCO movement. I think we have had such strong support from the business community, it's been, it's been fantastic because I think that everybody sees the advantage of having better coordinated care that could actually lower costs. I say that, but I'm also trying to be a very realistic when we say we still have a ways to go. We've got to demonstrate value in order for the business community to really come on board. And I think, you know, there's um, a lot of um, optimism, but I think, you know, we, we have some time to demonstrate that we can actually, you know, improve health and lower costs within the Medicaid population, and I think the business community is going to be there. I think when you look at some of the details around the exchange, the business community really is just kind of salivating to get um, into this. Because if you look at some of these common components, one has to do with a defined contribution approach. So if you think about it from an employer perspective, an employer can really give an employee a defined contribution around health care, and that individual can then take those dollars, go to the exchange, and truly shop between plans um, around different policies. You can't do that today. So I think there really has been strong support from the business community, and I think it's going to be a value add across the board. Thank you. Steve Shell, member. I, I heard some references to uh, Moneyball and to Field of Dreams. I'd like to raise a question about Wall Street. Specifically, um, uh, fee for services. Uh, there was an article about two and a half years ago, something like that, in the New Yorker that dealt with fee for services in a place called McCollum, I think is the name of it, Texas. And uh, it was pretty clear that Wall Street was in operation there. And, and there were some comparisons made at that time between costs in Salem versus costs in Bend. So my question to Mike is, uh, are Ben doctors Gordon Geckos? You know, I'm, I'm going to take that rather than... Uh, 
because Mike has to go back to Bend every night. So uh, l l let me let me take that question. I, I think it's a great one. And um, what what the questioner is referring to is, is the fact that whether it's Bend versus Salem or McAllen, Texas, where that article was about, versus New York City or Sacramento versus um, uh, Boston. What, what we know is that the, the amount we pay for health care is really different city to city. And that in, in some cities and in some states, we pay much more for health care. And in other places, we pay less. But it's the other part of that question which we have to pay attention to. The, the health of the population isn't related to the amount spent. Those cities that spend more and more on health care don't have better health. In fact, many of them have worse health. And, and, and so the issue here is not about what we're spending. It's about focusing on health. And I, I think the, you know, the questioner implied, and you know, maybe appropriately so, that oftentimes some of the, the motives are about the finances and not about the health, and that's, I think, what we've been talking about, is that you know, that's because the system is rigged that way. People get paid for more care. They don't get paid for more health, and our hospitals, I, you can't blame them. That's their business model is they only get, get paid if they admit people. So we have to start to change the rules. We've got to change how we pay people, and we've got to make it so that what we're measuring our cities on and our communities is about health. City Club member. Three questions. One, which country has, which country's healthcare system has the highest on base percentage? Um, two, will the CCOs have designated hitters? And three, going back to the issue of employer provided healthcare, is it your vision that if you're successful, that the employers of the state will at some point band together and either uh, ask their employees if they're willing to take advantage of the coordinated care organizations you've created? or use their collective purchasing power to force the medical industry to create new CCOs for people who are now in the private healthcare market? Before Mike answers though, Steve, I just want to say we're going to play by American League, not National League rules. <laughs> no, Steve, that's a fair question. It's something that we have really been thinking all along um, with the development of CCOs. So again, think about it from the state perspective. I mentioned um, 600,000 lives covered on Medicaid. That doesn't include an additional 300,000 that are covered through public employees and through schools. So the, the state is purchasing health care for roughly a million lives. So we want to be able to leverage that the best we can to actually move this CCO framework forward. And again, it gets back to if we can actually demonstrate better value, then there's no reason why employees and employers wouldn't be looking at this um, as, a, uh, a, a, as a good vehicle. Hi, my name is Leslie Hildula. I'm a City Club member and also I work for the Small Business Development Center. So I have a small business question. There's a lot of hopeful conversation about improvements in healthcare and getting healthcare for everybody. So let's take people that I talk to every day, which is a shop owner, North Williams, has one employee. At the end of the year, they're bringing home maybe, if they're lucky, $30,000. Their employee, maybe $28,000. So in 2012, what, what can you say to this shopkeeper about their health care needs and their employees' health care needs? I, I think what, what you've just asked about is that, indeed, this is the problem we've, we've got to fix. That uh, pretty soon, in the next decade or two, the, if health care continues to increase in cost in the way it's been, and wages continue to increase as they have. Uh, in a little more than 10 years, uh, 10 to 20 years, we're going to see uh, health care costs be greater than the average wage in our nation. Uh, the, what you've described is an unsustainable system and something that we've got to grapple with. So. I think what we need to do for that shop owner and for everyone in this country is to begin to focus on how we can deliver on the promise of better health and better care 
and very aggressively put our shoulders to the wheel and look at how we can begin to deliver that at a cost we can all afford. Without that, uh, we're all going to you know, lose out on the promise of our nation's health care system. I personally believe we can do this. We've done it in every other industry. Uh, the, the computer on my desk is 100 times faster and, quite frankly, about uh, three to four times less expensive than the one that I bought 15 years ago. And we've been able to engineer in our country, we've been able to engineer better and better technology, and we've been able to leverage the things that we need in a way that makes them available and accessible to all, and that's what we need to do. We've got incredible advances in healthcare, and if they continue to be as expensive as they are, what they do is continue to widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots, not narrow the gap between the haves and the have-nots. And we need to work on this, and I think what we can say to the person on North William Street is that, thank goodness here in Oregon, we're really going to start to address the root cause of the problem, and we need your help. My name is Sharon Joy, City Club member, and my brother, who came from Nebraska, and ended up on the panel of experts in the Asian sector of the World Health Organization, has been talking like you since I was a kid. I am absolutely delighted. Um, and incidentally about baseball, I want a states league. People here that we are voting for are rooting for, and then I would go to baseball or what, whatever. Uh, we, I believe in the third side all the time, physical, intellectual, emotional, and I believe the health goes together, so I would like to coordinate that too. Uh, but my issue is, I, could have, I have been saving you maybe 95% of my costs because I've been as leaving nursing homes since 89 against medical advice, and I believe that we I'm still facing the fact that I will die unless I have appropriate care very soon. And it can save at least 95% of the costs. I have been in a wheelchair for 35 years. So uh, I'm high up on your expenses. But even when I'm saving your costs. Uh, my question is, you have omitted one thing. All that 35 years, I have not been able to work and it's extremely important for us to be able to have appropriate jobs too because that takes our mind off of our health and so I would like that coordinated um, I can talk to you but let's say thank you I can't I don't even have a question I just I won't have too many questions let's put it that way um, Thanks, thank you, thank you. So, let, let me Sorry. you made a great point though and, uh, and and I think it's a great Oregon example that we can learn from and, and show how we can be successful. You know, Sh Sharon talked about uh, nursing homes and long-term care. I, I don't know if people really know this story here in Oregon, but we have a great story to tell. Uh, whereas most states have 60 to 70% of people who need long-term care in nursing homes, in Oregon, we've been able to only have about 20%. So we have more people who can get the care they need at home, which is where most people want to be. They get long-term care at home at a price that we can all afford. It's much more affordable to get care at home. We've changed the paradigm for the nation about long-term care. We deliver better care. Home care is better. Everybody wants to remain at home. And we do it at a better cost. All other, We lead the nation in this. All other states are coming to us and looking to see how we've done this because they want to do that. It's a great story, and I think it really exemplifies, you know, we did this with long-term care. We can do this with health care. It's about how you think about this, and it is about, I mean, I'll go back to the money ball analogy. It is about changing the rules of the game, and we did that in Oregon. We've done it successfully. We've got a long tradition of doing this, and I think you know, Sharon's comments really point to that. 
I'm afraid we'll have to stop there for today. We've run out of time for further questions. I hope you will all join us next week along with some new members when Sue Porter will discuss Oregon's unique Death with Dignity law. And as we close for today, please join me in thanking our speakers, Mike Bonetto and Bruce Goldberg. We are adjourned.